Okay, uh, good morning to everybody. My name is Gonzalo Tancredi from Uruguay. I'm the chair of the Symposium 374, Astronomical Hazard for Life on Earth. And well, until the last uh, General Assembly, I was the president of the Division F, Planetary Systems and Astrobiology. For this uh, plenary lecture of the symposium, we have invited Milan Sirkovic. Dr. Sirkovic is a research professor at the Astronomical Observatory of Belgrade, Serbia. He obtained his PhD at the Department of Physics of the State University of New York in Stony Brook in the year 2000 with a thesis related to astrophysical cosmology. Nowadays, his primary research interests are in the field of astrobiology, philosophy of science, and risk analysis, in particular, global catastrophes, observation and selection effects, and epistemology of risk. He co-edited the widely cited anthology on global catastrophic risks, published by Oxford University Press in year 2008, with uh, Nick Bostrom, and he wrote three research monographs, the, the latest one, The Great Science, The Science and Philosophy of Fermi Paradox, also by Oxford University Press, as well as many popular and scientific papers. Uh, well, when we proposed this symposium, I think it was many years ago, <laughs> It was a preview of this pandemic. And well, we didn't face that we are in this situation. Uh, we were thinking about the future astronomical hazards. Uh, and I think it's a good opportunity after we speed in all these, uh, well, let's say global catastrophes uh, in, in, in our planet that we start thinking about what could come from other uh, uh, celestial objects. So it's a pleasure for me to give the uh, talk to Dr. Sirkovic. Thank you very much. I hope we can hear each other fine. I have a great Gratitude to Gonzalo and to other organizers of this uh, wonderful event. Uh, let me go straight to the talk because it is a huge topic and I can only give a very brief, almost cartoonish-like presentation. So I hope there will be a lot of time for discussion subsequently. Uh, so, okay, I'll start with a famous quote from Heraclitus, who, which is actually very useful in thinking about this topic in several different ways. And we shall see in both ways of the subject matter of astrobiology and also in our view of wider methodological and philosophical consequences. Um, a brief outline of the talk will be uh, is this it's centered on three uh, basic parts uh, one is presenting the whole uh, rare earth hypothesis or controversy if you wish uh, discussing the relationship of uh, counterfactual thinking and counterfactual arguments in rare earth hypothesis and uh, of presenting the astronomical hazards within the overall astrobiological landscape, which I think is very useful from both cognitive and methodological points of view. Uh, okay, let's start at the beginning, at the very end of the last century and the last millennium uh, in the year 2000, a new and sensational best-selling book appeared entitled Rare Earth, Why Complex Life is Uncommon in the Universe, 
uh, by Peter Ward and Don Brownlee. Uh, you see the title page here, and it immediately generated a huge controversy. Uh, a man from the shadow, as some observers and reviewers called him, Guillermo Gonzalez is also here. Uh, he was a co-author of the seminal paper on the galactic habitable zone published in 2001. But also he is a bit infamous, if you wish, uh, by uh, for writing a, a book, Privileged Planet, which has an overt intelligent design intention and implications uh, so this is we can see immediately one of the weak spots of the rare earth hypothesis which is uh, that it has been at least misused and maybe even used by proponents of intelligent designs and uh, other anthropocentric or if you wish even geocentric thinkers uh, What's the substance of the rare earth hypothesis? Well, there are many independent conditions or prerequisites for complex habitability, which we encounter on our earth. Uh, we need to find ourselves in a right kind of home galaxy, which seems rather obvious, or at least until very recently, until last like five or six years, it was seemed rather obvious. Uh, there are various habitable zones which present parts of the overall configuration space uh, which are conducive to complex life forms, like the galactic habitable zone conceived as a narrow annular ring in the disk of the Milky Way, as well as various circumstellar habitable zones which are usually conceived as narrow rings around the home stars in various planetary systems. Now, of course, what we encounter in our solar system is uh, seemingly uh, fine-tuned, or if you wish, rare coincidences, such as having a large planetary satellite, our moon, which provides stable rotation axis, uh, having a giant planet like Jupiter, which allegedly uh, provides some protection, acts as a shield against small body impacts. And of course, we have various uh, fine tunings or alleged fine tunings uh, among things like plate tectonics, exist as existence of long lived radioactive R elements necessary for plate tectonics, etc. Uh, etc. Et uh, one of the advantages of the rare earth hypothesis as a theoretical system is that it is essentially an open system. Everyone can add some items to this list. Now, if we have multiple independent requirements and we need to investigate critically whether they are really as independent as Ward and Brownlee claimed, uh, in any case, their conjunction is described by multiplying probabilities. So product of multiplying many small probabilities is obviously an extremely small probability. So we have probabilistic reasons to conclude that uh, a complex biosphere like uh, our terrestrial one is rare, at least in the Milky Way, if not in the visible universe. So they constructed even something which they dubbed the rare earth equation by analogy with the Drake equation. And of course, here we can also see some weaknesses uh, which follow, in a sense, naturally from the same analogy. Uh, now, this is not really quite a new idea, as some or most of proponents have advertising have been advertising relentlessly since the year 2000. Uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, the co-discoverer of the biological evolution through natural selection, actually came very close to it in his book, Man's Place in the Universe, published in 1903. Uh, so he argued, as you can see, and even illustrated in his magnificent uh, drawings that our stellar system is small and we have to be near its center as many people 
including Jacobus Captain and other great astronomers at the turn of the 20th century believed. Uh, so the reason why we need to find ourselves near the center of our galaxy is that sufficiently stable conditions in Wallace's opinion for life existed only there. So many, he also came to the idea that many independent prerequisites are necessary for evolving humans, but at the very end, he actually kind of retreated into mysticism by claiming that anyway, mind cannot really emerge by, na by natural selection and other naturalistic processes. Uh, in a sense, rare earth hypothesis or REH, as I will, uh, <laughs> I will refer to it often. Uh, is perhaps the astrobiology debate of our time. Uh, many arguments can be gathered, both pro and con. Um, it was certainly the first comprehensive serious theoretical framework in astrobiology. It led to a host of important new concepts. Uh, it was the first such framework to take explicitly into account observation selection effects. It is an open system. It offers a kind of, I mean, maybe not entirely persuasive solution to Fermi's paradox. On the other hand, it's, uh, it's one of very few scientific th hypotheses or theories which openly flaunt Copernicanism and tries to reintroduce under a guise a kind of a geocentric and geocentric viewpoint which were rejected in the last 500 years of the development of science. Uh, it smacks of the idea of uh, Voltaire's Dr. Pangloss in the sense that the earth is the very best place of all. So actually everything which occurred in earth history and everything which occurs on earth now is must be for the best. Uh, as the authors themselves admit uh, in their concluding chapter, perhaps the most important criticism of the rare earth hypothesis is that it simply betrays lack of of imagination and failure of our imagination to imagine really uh, truly different path to complex biospheres. And of course, there are, there are some other topics which we will return later in this talk. Uh, the role of astronomical hazards as the main theme of this meeting uh, are of course very prominent in all the, in the rare earth hypothesis itself and in all the debates which it provoked. Uh, there are two aspects here. Uh, one is that counterfactual arguments which actually play on astronomical hazards, especially uh, the small body impact hazard uh, invoked by rare earth proponents are at best misleading and at, and at worst, as I shall try to uh, demonstrate logically incoherent. And of course, uh, there is another role for astronomical hazards on a wider scale, and that is to shape astrobiological landscape, the most general space of astrobiological parameters and actually to offer us very useful, tantalizing, but very useful clues uh, on uh, how the overall astrobiological dynamics occurs in the Milky Way and increasingly in last couple of years in other galaxies as well. So there are many other, many reasons to oppose rare earth hypotheses which, uh, which were mentioned in uh, the literature, but uh, I will not go into them right here. I mean, one of them, uh, obviously, perhaps most obvious of all are some of its failed predictions. Uh, already falsified predictions are, for instance, that hot Jupiters will remain a high fraction of extrasolar planets discovered, which spectacularly failed, especially after the Kepler mission. So we now know that hot Jupiters, in contrast to what Ward and Brownlee wrote, uh, constitute maybe less than 10%, maybe 8% of the old extrasolar planets discovered. 
And of course, they also claim that hot Jupiters actually prevent the existence of other planets uh, in uh, the circumstellar habitable zones, which was spectacularly falsified by the discovery of uh, counterexamples. The most famous counterexample, WASP 47, uh, which has two other planets in habitable zone uh, behind, so to speak the hot Jupiter, which was, who, which was first discovered. And one of them is super Earth with about six Earth masses, which could hypothetically be a habitable planet. Uh, there are other things in the overall armament of uh, rare Earth supporters, which are rather vulnerable. Uh, the assumption of very narrow circumstellar habitable zones uh, is perhaps false. Uh, rare Earth mispresents planetary geology, arguing the, the, uh, against uh, large scale plate movements on bodies like Venus or Pluto, which was disproved by subsequent research. Uh, it demotivates research into very exotic, non terrestrial kinds of life, which is also useful to, to, to understand. Uh, and of course, there is there are inherently biological reasons for doubting rare uh, hypotheses, and uh, notably the importance of evolvability in emergence of a complex biosphere, which was a kind of a domain where uh, Ward and Brown is simply dare not enter, and uh, which has actually a lot of uh, optimistic under quote marks. Uh, things to say about our search for extraterrestrial life. Uh, and of course, as a kind of uh, uh, reduction uh, or reductio ad absurdum, uh, we can always find some new examples of fine tuning if we look closely enough, or if we wish to find it. For instance, we can say, oh, uh, solar orbit in the, in the galactic gravitational potential is also kind of fine-tuned uh, because there are many kinds of uh, of orbits which we can integrate like like this as in the study of Hunt et al. Uh, and uh, of course we can argue whether solar orbit is really a kind of typical or, or atypical and each particular orbit can be arbitrarily and artificially made atypical by artificially constraining the domain of, uh, of model parameters. So actually this sounds a kind of a futile and a kind of a rhetoric rather than scientific exercise. Uh, all this motivates a wider set of questions. Uh, in general, we need to think more about what kind of explanation is searched for or offered by astrobiology, whether we wish to have something which is uh, allegedly complete or having no loose ends in Dilbert's fine phrase here in this cartoon, or maybe we wish to go uh, to, to avoid circular reasoning and to avoid having a debate on so mostly on semantic issues or on issues which are uh, over specified or under specified or over specified uh, in uh, resolving particular problems or particular observation selection effects that applies mostly to observation selection as we shall see. Uh, this leads to a major philosophical dilemma, which has not been elucidated enough so far. Uh, we can all agree that habitability is perhaps the most important concept in astrobiology or present day astrobiology. But to what extent habitability is a kind of a universal category, uh, which has its rather objective and non parochial definition, or habitability is necessarily dependent or entailed by the terrestrial kind of life, and so in effect it is a kind of parochial measure. Now, of course, the defenders of the second option will say, oh, but we have nothing else to go from, uh, and so there is some merit in it, but we need to realize that this is a real dilemma, and we need to explore very carefully each of its horns. 
so I shall try to uh, to show how impact hazards are actually misused in counterfactual reasoning, which underpins rare earth hypothesis in the second part of the talk. Uh, so again, consider our friend Jupiter. So the idea originating back here with George Rattel and some earlier uh, authors is that Jupiter acts as a kind of shield decreasing the flux of comets and other outer solar system bodies, which would otherwise impact Earth and cause global extinctions. Uh, since the presence of a planet with properties similar to that of Jupiter, if you wish, a right planet at the right place is a priori improbable, so we can say that the necessary increase in Earth's habitability due to lack or decreased frequency of impacts is actually something which is fine-tuned and rare and improbable a priori to be found on, in any other planetary system in the Milky Way. Uh, at a glance, this is confirmed by, for instance, observing the impact of Shoemaker-Levy 9 uh, on Jupiter in mid-1990s. Uh, so at least some comets are surely either absorbed as Shoemaker-Levy or deflected uh, by Jupiter. But is that effect really important and whether it is important in uh, astrobiology of planetary systems in general? Uh, in a stricter form, we can we can uh, present the reasoning uh, of Warden Brownlee here like this: We have both Earth and Jupiter in our solar system. Jupiter deflects a fraction of impactors from hazardous uh, orbits. Uh, less potential impactors means uh, less catastrophic impacts. And of course, less catastrophic impacts means uh, increased habitability. Therefore, from these four premises, we can draw a conclusion that Earth's habitability is increased due to the presence of Jupiter. So it seems fine and plausible. However, and it is a big however, uh, one problem is whether the deflection requirement is empirically correct, in fact. Uh, the very diligent work of Horner and Jones in, in 2008, 2012 uh, resulted in a series of uh, numerical studies which showed that Jupiter might even enhance the impact of flux over, over long periods of time. So this issue is quite complex. There are many technical details. Uh, for what follows, I shall assume actually that uh, original rare earth suggestion is correct and the Jupiter as it is now actually does deflect potential impactors and, and thus decreases frequency of this kind of astronomical hazard. So, uh, but we should keep this in mind that this is another weakness in, in their armor, so to speak. A uh, real question, as with all counterfactual statements, is is there an Earth without a Jupiter? So what exactly uh, Warden Brownlee would have us believe is that we can be sure in, uh, in an exercise, which is in historiography recently has been called virtual history, actually the experiments in historical science, which we all know are in fact, impossible or almost impossible. Uh, but now we can think about uh, uh, counterfactual historical pathways as a thought experiments, and perhaps we can uh, add some numerical simulations there and try to investigate consequences of different historical pathways. Now, uh, think about this. This problem is whether we can have Earth without Jupiter, with everything else equal, or as philosophers would say, Ceteris Paribus. Now, uh, there is a wrong, formally wrong inference, which is often used in this kind of arguments. Uh, if you have from A and B follows some consequence X, but we cannot really observe B, 
perhaps because it is very tough to be observed, or perhaps as it is here, it is hidden in the midst of the past in the initial conditions for the formation of solar system, for instance, then it is often wrongly inferred that if we do not observe A, but observe some other A prime, that in, from this, it follows that the consequence X uh, does, uh, does not entail. So this is wrong, of course, because not only it could be the case that there is some other B prime, which is consistent with A prime and together they again imply consequence X, but it also might be the case that the state of affairs simply where we have A prime and this unobservable B is either physically impossible or even logically incoherent. So this is the true swindle of the proponents of rare earth, which they use in other historical counterfactuals. You can employ everything here uh, when criticizing their rare moon and other this rare X stuff. Uh, how can we achieve solar system without Jupiter? We can imagine that we have a magic wand in the manner of Harry Potter, for instance, and they do that have magical removal of Jupiter. But this won't work because we know that Magical ones don't work in the real world. So actually what we need is different set of initial conditions. And different set of initial conditions may be even impossible to find in the space of all initial conditions. And even if it's possible to find something, how then can we know that the resulting planet in the habitable zone is really Earth? So this leads us to kind of a murky waters of philosophical discussions of modality and necessity. Imagine with the great American philosophers, Willard, Warren, and Quine, uh, imagine this. Somebody tells you solar system has eight planets. Eight is necessarily less than nine, obviously, necessarily, analytically, logically, however you wish. So is this conclusion justified? Solar system necessarily has less than 10 planets. Now, obviously, uh, Quine and many others, everyone perhaps here uh, thinks that this looks wrong. We simply cannot argue that solar system necessarily has less than nine planets, and we could, we think, imagine situations in which solar system could have been formed with, say, 11 planets instead of eight. So, where's the catch? Uh, the catch is in confusing uh, the so-called Dere and the to understanding of statements which uh, express counterfactual reasoning. Uh, suppose that I say Neil Armstrong was the first man of the moon, or following Milos Forman and the band R.E.M., we can say that Andy Kaufman was the first man of the moon. So if we regard these about statements of things themselves, their rare statements, then obviously the first one is correct and the second one is false statement. First one is true and second one is false statement. But you know, this simply <laughs> cannot mean in the same time that there is not a possible world in which Neil Armstrong after becoming the first man on the moon simply changed his name to Andy Kaufman and then the statement Andy Kaufman was the first man on the moon would have been correct, wouldn't it? Uh, Quine struggled with such a problem and in his paper from 1943, which is useful even to astrophysicists and astrobiologists, he actually argued that uh, for a doctrine later developed called actualism, which actually can help us <laughs> resolve uh, the rare earth counterfactuals uh, by making first the distinction between naming or designation and meaning itself. If we say that evening star is the same as morning star is the same as Venus, that's obviously a correct statement of astronomy. And of course, it is a correct statement of English language that evening star is not the same name as morning star. So under single quotes, as, as in these examples, we can say that Neil Armstrong is certainly not the same name as Andy Kaufman. And of course, we can have various temporal extensions in which uh, uh, it is in the same sense true that 
Neil Armstrong was Neil Armstrong up to some point, and then the Kaufman after that. And of course, obviously, we can also say there is a legitimate language in which, for instance, Neil Armstrong mean is the same name as Andy Kaufman, etc., etc. So actually, we can have de dicto or from words themselves uh, a reading of some counterfactual statement. This corresponds to famous Aristotelian distinction between essential and accidental properties, obviously, uh, which was a kind of obsessive theme in Aristotelian philosophy. Uh, so essential properties are uh, simply those which uh, make sense uh, when the re statements are taken seriously. That means that Neil Armstrong is by some essential property, not by his name, different person than Andy Kaufman was different person, not by, by some other, other essential property. Uh, obviously, as Agatha Christie would have said it, it's not important who the suspect is, it is important who the suspect is, and if you read a paradox in this statement, that is just because you uh, don't, uh, don't bring a t sufficient attention to the emphasis, in the first uh, line it is not important who the suspect is in a sense of his name, which is treated as a kind of accidental property, it is important who the suspect is in a sense that we need to find characteristics and traits which make him a, or her a suspect uh, and not just the name but some really essential properties. Uh, so uh, the argument of rare earth theorists is predicated on our taking the re modality seriously. Namely, there is a possible world without Jupiter and in which there is an Earth which is less habitable than our Earth. So, it would follow from this that habitability of Earth is an accidental property, which is a kind of bizarre, especially for people who actually affirm an anti-Copernican attitude. And the, uh, that would also mean that Earth must have some other essential properties which enable our identification of such planet as the Earth. Note that in contrast to this, if we read the statement in the dicto sense, just as a statement about names, it isn't controversial at all. This means something else some other planet in this possible world without Jupiter will be named Earth. For instance, if it is something like a TRAPPIST-1 system, we can say, okay, this is like TRAPPIST-1E TRAPPIST or F is the Earth, we shall call something Earth. And this is not at all controversial. In contrast to uh, their uh, much, much stronger and much more controversial statement above, so this immediately leads us to the problem of this transworld identity, as philosophers would say. Uh, we see uh, here a painting by a very infamous, very infamous painter, amateur painter, uh, as Lord Bertrand Russell allegedly said, if Hitler had been accepted at the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts, the Second World War would have been avoided. So this sounds fine and plausible, uh, but if you think a little bit more about this, would that have been the Hitler in a sense of that historical person which we identify by his essential and malignant properties? So Quine's solution is actually, was actually to deny the truth of uh, and even meaning of most of their statements. As he argued in his actualist papers, no entity should be without identity, so that the possibilia, these other versions, uh, are just a way of speaking. This is something which we use, de dicto and not de re. So we have no reason whatsoever to think that de re model statement convey any kind of truth. So with that, the whole argument of uh, some counterfactual Earth without Jupiter goes away. We don't need to bother too much about it because it simply does not correspond to anything and cannot correspond to anything real, to anything in the real naturalistic world without magic wands and, you know, Harry Potters and stuff. 
So with that, we come to the third and the broadest of, of, of three main parts of, of this talk is, uh, and that is what astronomical hazards in general tell us about uh, the widest space of parameters, this astrobiological landscape. Uh, first, uh, a very small uh, aside uh, from the domain of macroevolutionary theory. Uh, now, we can have a kind of evolution on the level of biospheres, of entire biospheres, which is obviously of enormous importance to astrobiology, as argued by a prominent evolutionist for the little. Uh, we can have a situation in which extinction alone causes changes in character with relative frequency, which is the definition of, of, of natural selection, by the way. And one such important biospheric trait is evolvability. And it is, in a sense, enshrined in the coding concept or the very basic logical and informational principles in which a transfer of information within any biosphere, Earth's biosphere, and any other possible biosphere uh, is uh, realized once for all times. We all know that the, the essentials of uh, genome of all living creatures on Earth is uh, one and the same since the last universal common ancestor and even probably before it. So actually in that case, we can have a situation which uh, as described by Ford a little in which some external selection pressure, which by the way is astrophysical environment, those are astronomical hazards we are talking about. Resistance to perturbations caused by impacts of small bodies and by explosions of nearby supernova uh, or gamma ray burst explosions or maybe magnetar explosions or uh, other um, uh, deleterious consequences of passages through galactic spiral arms, etc., etc. All this acts as a kind of selection filter and uh, long-term survival of any biosphere invokes a balance between evolvability which enables uh, at least some taxons within uh, some taxa within biosphere to uh, survive any kind of catastrophe and of course uh, uh, the same uh, those balance must be strike uh, between evolvability on one side and stability of heritable information which makes a biosphere a biosphere which makes it uh, which prevents it you know, from like fissioning or fracturing into several distinct biospheres so this is a kind of a, a mean path something uh, which can be encapsulated in a metaphor of walking down the evolvability alley uh, finding both available evolutionary paths and those which are favored by natural selection, exactly natural selection in a form of astronomical hazards. So this occurs on the background of galactic habitable zone, which was introduced by Gonzalez, Brownlee and Ward in 2001 and elaborated further by Line Weaver and his collaborators. Uh, what is interesting here is that uh, from the very beginning, the concept of the galactic habitable zone included uh, the idea of uh, uh, pruning, so to speak, planetary systems and planetary habitats uh, by astronomical hazard, especially by, by supernovae and the gamma ray bursts. Now, one can see that the overall dynamics uh, changes dramatically if we construct, for instance, a simplified model in which uh, we can slide up and down the intensity of, of obviously in a thought experiment or in a numerical experiment nowadays, uh, we can slide up and down uh, the intensity of uh, these radiation hazards and see what, uh, what are the consequences for uh, some measure of habitability. And one thing uh, very, which is important to, to do 
do is to use the realistic initial conditions in the sense of ages of terrestrial planets, uh, which were given by Charles Trans Weaver in, in this 2001 paper and la later further elaborated. Uh, so uh, we're using those conditions. And for instance, in a simplified model, which was published by me and my then uh, doctoral student Brian Slavukotic in 2008, uh, we can actually, we have actually subsumed all catastrophic dependence into a single parameter Q. So uh, Q, when Q is small, uh, that means that the evolution, astrobiological evolution is mostly gradualistic. So there are no uh, big deal uh, interruptions by large catastrophes. And when Q rises, the importance of catastrophes and catastrophic resets of evolution on various biospheres uh, rises in importance. And so what we see here, um, N is an arbitrary, arbitrary measure of uh, outcome after the uh, run simulation for like 10 billion years, uh, we, we can just say how many possible or viable biospheres remain. And we can see that uh, in general, what is the most important conclusion from this, that in general for low values of Q, we have a kind of monotonous ascent. And for very high value of, value of Q for very important uh, uh, very important catastrophic events. We can we have uh, some rugged landscape with these wide plateaus separated by steep ascents, and so we have we, uh, we encounter this step-like behavior. Uh, obviously, we encounter a kind of much smaller uh, outcome in a sense of much smaller number of possibly inhabited. Uh, habitats uh, but this uh, more important than the absolute number is just the behavior the profile which actually indicates that uh, uh, at all those plateaus we have a kind of uh, biospheres which are temporally correlated so they have similar age in terms of obviously astronomical and evolutionary time scales so these uh, planets these uh, potential sites of, for uh, studying of biosignatures and technosignatures as well are reasonable targets in a sense that uh, we don't want our either biosignatures or especially technosignatures to differ too much in age from us. So we know precisely the age of the Earth and the solar system. We know how far are we from the beginning of star formation in the thin disk of the Milky Way. So we actually mm, can compare, we can give relative ages for any other potentially habitable extrasolar planet. And so actually we don't want this uh, difference to be too large. Uh, in order to be able to meaningfully compare uh, biosignatures or perhaps technosignatures as well to what we expect. Obviously, our expectations and our models become very murky and very unclear if the age difference is too large. This especially pertains to technosignatures or to SETI projects because what we expect to detect uh, in SETI projects is a greatly a function of difference between the uh, potential other extraterrestrial civilizations age and our age. Uh, obviously, this kind of simple numerical simulations is uh, can we do well, nowadays we can do much better by employing, for instance, uh, large scale and body cosmological simulations. And so uh, actually, if we try to uh, infer the shape and extent of galactic habitable zone through a kind of uh, uh, typical n body smooth particle hydro hydro code uh, we can in spite of still poor mass resolution obtain very useful results uh, for instance in this particular simulation which you use this gadget to uh, and which was compiled by Vukotic Tal in um, 
2016, uh, we, if we wish to uh, count particles, mass particles corresponding to to, uh, to stellar particles in the simulation, uh, which uh, possess uh, this continuous habitability quality, which we have defined precisely in, in that study, uh, we actually see that initially we have nothing and we have very small amplitude of continuously habitable stellar particles but after the simulation is over at 10 uh, billion years of age for the thin disk population uh, we have a kind of well structured uh, galactic habitable zone which has some fine structure here as well uh, which comprises a rather large fraction of the order of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 of the old stellar particles, and uh, which is interestingly enough uh, concentrated toward larger values of a galactocentric distance uh, than the solar circle. So actually, this could, this could be a very in interesting uh, indication for target selection for further biosignature and technosignature searches uh, that we should actually explore outer galaxy more and go to larger galactocentric distances of say like 10 to 15 kiloparsecs in order to encounter most habitable sites and the other cosmological simulations which have been done in the meantime in the last five six years uh, have in general confirmed this trend and of course we can go farther and farther in configuration space and try to investigate habitability of other galaxies as well and the pioneering work was done by Pratika Dayal who, who with her collaborators in 2015 uh, published important study in which uh, they have shown that uh, more terrestrial planets per unit mass we can actually encounter in elliptical galaxies which is also by the way contrary to predictions or even stronger word than prediction is appropriate here which you can read in the rare earth book by ward and brownlee and in their paper with with gonzalez uh, in 2001 uh, which actually discarded habitability of early type galaxies completely uh, what is very important from the point of view of our topic here uh, is that even with the correction for lower metallicity, uh, the effect of catastrophic events, notably uh, supernovae, especially supernovae type 2 and gamma ray burst explosions, are still dominant in the overall tally of galactic habitability. Uh, this is this has been obviously quite a, a bombshell when it was published. So this is still quite open and live research question. It's not that everybody agrees on that. It is highly debatable and controversial. Uh, but that would open another way of attacking the rare Earth premises. In a sense, the whole subfield the whole topic of habitability of galaxies is a kind of inherently antithetical to the ideas of uh, the rare hypothesis um, the pioneering study by stanway et al uh, actually used another important cosmological tool which are merger trees to investigate histories of potentially habitable galaxies and to investigate uh, in what way uh, have uh, galactic mergers, some of which were, as we now know, accompanied by a uh, star, star burst of star formation and uh, increased in catastrophic risks from supernovae and gamma ray burst events. We are in, in some senses, it turns out, at least in a fraction sizable fraction of cases studied by Stanway and her collaborators. Uh, what we see is 
uh, in many ways enhancing of habitability after that initial burst of star formation following a major merger is over. Uh, using even better simulation, these are results from uh, TNG, uh, is uh, in a paper by uh, Stojkovic et al. Uh, we can see that there is an interesting area of possible the, um, types of galaxies uh, with rather interesting properties in terms of habitability. And this is this cloudlet of, of, of points here, uh, which would correspond to high metallicity dwarf galaxies. Some uh, objects similar, for instance, to M32 or to Fornax dwarf galaxy in our vicinity, uh, but there are surely many, many more of them around, which could also be a potential habitats for, for life. Uh, in those cases, it would be added, uh, it, it, it would have some kind of added value from an astrobiological point of view of uh, having uh, no significant uh, central nuclear engine so the, the the central nuclear engine outbursts uh which have been long speculated since at least 1980s or if we wish to add some speculations by sir fred hoyle from 1960s onwards to be a kind of catastrophic event detrimental to life all over a galaxy in which it occurs so here and elsewhere, what we actually have is a kind of uh, the Copernican mirror. And this is a wonderful photograph taken by a friend of mine uh, in front of the Polish Academy of Sciences. This is a monument to Copernicus, obviously. Uh, namely, if we find the Earth, the Milky Way, or local group of galaxies, any other oh, habitat of ours, inclusive habitat of ours, is typical in its reference class, uh, then very obviously, by better understanding the reference class, we better understand our own habitat as well. So this is one of the promises of astrobiology, which is highly important and highly relevant uh, for future research and for future research, not only purely from scientific point of view, but I would argue from some practical points of view as well, uh, because actually what we wish to understand our habitat, not only for purely cognitive sake, but also for knowing and understanding how to be most efficient uh, in its sustainable management. Uh, so gradually we have approached uh, uh, the, the, the concluding part of this talk and what I would like to, to state at the end is that it's quite certain after more than 20 years of sometimes ferocious debate is that rare earth arguments are much weaker than it is usually assumed. So this is somewhat in contrast with the popularity that the rare earth hypothesis still enjoys in many circles. Uh, especially in kind of a popular science circles, which is a kind of paradoxical because one would expect that uh, a kind of anti-Copernican doctrine, which actually is quite skeptical toward, toward finding interesting life elsewhere. I mean, not just any kind of life. Obviously, even the authors of the rare earth hypothesis acknowledge that uh, simple bacterial uh, extremophile life is probably widely spread in the universe because it's there is uh, simply these organisms are simply too robust and they are actually sufficiently robust for a wide range of astrobiological conditions so while simple life may be ubiquitous uh, the central tenet of the rare earth hypothesis is that complex life which is what usually people consider life you mean when you say life to a guy in the street or a girl in the street he or she will say oh these are plants and animals maybe some birds and mammals and you know your puppy dog or whatever so uh what you have here and of course obviously 
if somebody is a scientist engages engaging it in SETI studies or search for techno signatures, then he or she would put a bar much higher as well because advanced technological civilizations which are uh, expected to leave kind of a detectable techno signatures are obviously still more complex, perhaps orders of magnitude more complex arrangements than even most of life we see around us. So uh, in spite of that, though, this kind of pessimistic attitude, uh, rare hypothesis remains very popular in science journals among popular citizens of science. People like, I don't know, like uh, Brian Cox and others are uh, making, uh, making it a uh, very fashionable, very up to date, in spite of the fact that it is not. And as the time passes and as uh, the pace of uh, very exciting results, especially on extrasolar planets, but in other domains as well, increases. We actually gradually see uh, more and more of its predictions being falsified and its arguments being weaker than hitherto assumed. So this is, in particular, this holds for a kind of modal argument, which starts with you know, if X or Y were different, then we would have such and such consequences for habitability. So this is something which is which simply holds very poorly. And this is something which uh, where, by the way, uh, the tools of analytic philosophy can do much to uh, disperse a kind of mental fog or confusion surrounding those issues because those counterfactual uh, arguments seem very plausible but if you think more and more and more seriously about them there this kind of superficial plausibility evaporates very fast obviously everything is down to careful work and study especially theoretical and numerical uh, work on elucidations of all the, the details of this large astrobiological landscape uh, and ironically enough and i would like to 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 end uh, my talk on a positive note uh, it shows that astronomical hazards ironically in spite of being potentially vastly disrupt disruptive and destructive events uh, can play a positive explanatory role, most of all, and possibly they play a crucial dynamical role in astrobiological dynamics and astrobiological evolution of our universe as well. So here, uh, I would thank you for your attention. This is, by the way, a nice visual metaphor. This is a Ericsson globe in, uh, in Stockholm, the largest spherical structure produced so far, uh, on top of which a Swedish art group created a, a small house, which it seems like a dollhouse to an average observer of this photograph, but it is in fact a real size, uh, the Swedish traditional uh, village house, uh, which actually demonstrates uh, how our home or our what is what we have got accustomed ourselves to, including our Earth and our solar system, is can actually be very. Uh, my, it looks to us both much smaller from one side of the story and much bigger and more important from the other than it actually is in the overall cosmological scheme of things. Uh, thank you for your attention and all questions and comments are welcome. Okay, uh, thanks to Milan, uh, in particular to for emphasizing the importance of the dialogue that we have to have between philosophers, astronomers, and many other uh, scientists. So uh, the presentation is open for questions. You can approach the microphone there. And uh, there are, 
you could also ask questions through the platform, and I will be reading it. Hello, Tom Statler, NASA headquarters. Um, thanks for a very thought-provoking talk, and especially about the modal arguments. And I understand why, if I wanted to argue, for example, that uh, giant impacts, among other things, opened up an ecological niche for mammals with large brains to evolve, so yay, giant impacts. The fallacy in that is that I haven't studied all of the other ways that a, an equivalent ecological niche might have opened. So given that understanding, at the same time in science we use Bayesian inference, where we imagine many alternative pasts, calculate the probability that the actual observed data would have been obtained, and, and that's the Bayesian likelihood, and we make inference based on that, and we believe that that's okay. So there's some middle ground where a modal argument can, the, the question can be asked in the right way, right? So is there a way of fixing the REH argument in order to ask the right questions and show that there is a logic there, but it leads to something else? Thank you. This is, this is a wonderful question, actually. This is something uh, I simply, for the lack of time, I couldn't talk um, much uh, in the presentation itself. Uh, but the thing is, uh, okay, first of all, uh, you are completely right that uh, there is uh, in all arguments which uh, show that we should feel very lucky that an asteroid hit the Earth 65 million years ago uh, and created space for our evolution as mammals. Uh, we simply don't know whether dinosaurs, for instance, uh, could have evolved uh, intelligence, technology, civilization millions of years prior. Uh, in fact, there are some arguments to the effect that uh, uh, at least one major mass extinction, the one at the end of Mesozoic and the beginning of Cenozoic on the Triassic perm, uh, uh, Permian-Triassic boundary uh, actually did slow down encephalization of animals at that point. Of course, this is very tentative. This is something which is uh, which is very difficult to establish empirically. Uh, but some of paleontologists which have studied the question. Um, including Taylor Russell and others, uh, have actually concluded that, uh, uh, in fact, after this huge catastrophe 251 million years ago, uh, the, 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 the pace of animals getting smarter, so to speak, I mean, if you consider encephalization as a kind of a metrics for smarts, which is, of course, uh, has, has some of its own problems, uh, but this slowed down after a catastrophic event. Uh, so in a sense that we consider this a kind of, at least epistemically random event, probably, and in, in the case of impacts of small bodies, it is effectively random, at least from our point of view, although in some wider metaphysics sense, sense of things, it might have been deter predetermined. Uh, but in that case, uh, there are some uh, random impacts on this approach to high complexity intelligence, tool making, self-awareness, or whatever you consider your favorite prerequisite for having a deb debate like this. <laughs> so. Uh, so that is that's that's one part of the question. The other is obviously, of course, Bayesian analysis is the only way to go here. And what we need to do is to study the space of initial conditions very carefully, so that we uh, simply delineate those chunks of the parameter space which can evolve into some uh, configurations where we would have a sensible comparison of habitability of a planet within a circumstellar uh, habitable zone. 
Now, this careful analysis, to the best of my knowledge, has not been performed yet because it is both conceptually and numerically as well a kind of a formidable task. I mean, we need simply uh, simply the space. We need uh, we still uh, need more knowledge about uh, the process of planetary formation and especially early evolution of planetary systems uh, in order in order to see uh, those surprises like the surprise which I mentioned with the discovery of WASP 47, uh, which has a hot Jupiter very close orbit so periods I think four days or something like this. And it has a kind of smaller and potentially habitable planets or habitable exomoons uh, behind it. I mean, that was quite a, quite unexpected because everybody thought that uh, early migration of hot Jupiters would tend to disrupt anything uh, to be formed within habitable zone. So uh, th this was really a very nice and welcome surprise. Uh, welcome, I think, from a perspective of somebody who is optimistic about the search for life and habitable sites elsewhere. Uh, so I do hope that uh, in future uh, we will uh, have capacity for modeling the entire space of uh, initial conditions and exactly to do a kind of a Bayesian analysis which you mentioned. So it's completely correct way to go from uh, uh, for, from the best the best of my knowledge. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, well, I, I have a question. Uh, you, at the beginning of your talk, you introduced the famous Drake equation. And well, in view of the rare earth hypothesis, I, I suppose that uh, one should introduce, uh, let's say a zero term in this Drake equation, making that, well, almost it's impossible to, to have uh, civilizations. But uh, in view of what you have been discussing, what is the kind of correction or terms that one should introduce in the Drake equation to, to well, to, to look at the present knowledge of, uh, of the different aspects that you have been discussing? Uh, yep, yeah, that's, that's... That's a very interesting question. Thank you so much for, for it. Uh, it is something which I am a little bit hesitant to go into because I'm actually quite, quite skeptical about the way Drake's equation is used or some would say ritually invoked in many places and many contexts, some of contexts which are simply inappropriate. So, uh, so people have, uh, I mean, the equation was obviously a rule of time and Frank Drake himself uh, nowhere pretended it to be anything else. I mean, he didn't pretend it to be some sort of a deep uh, dynamical regularity, some sort of a law or whatever. So it was a rule of thumb for calculating possible number of SETI targets in the early days of the search for extraterrestrial or what would we nowadays would call its search for techno signatures. Uh, obviously, when our knowledge increases and our understanding becomes deeper, uh, we would like actually to substitute something, how to, how to put it uh, inoffensively, uh, more of substance uh, for each particular parameter in the Drake equation. Now, intuitively, we can all, we all know what those are because the parameters of the Drake equation are actually some average values or integrals, if you wish, over the underlying distribution functions. So there is an underlying distribution function of extrasolar planets and the number of habitats within each planet and uh, proper the number of uh, habitats uh, possessing necessary preconditions for abiogenesis, etc., etc. Uh, in some cases, 
for some individual parameters, we are now in much better position than Drake was like 60 plus years ago to give the underlying distribution itself. So we don't need to be satisfied with such coarse grained averaging, which actually destroys much of the useful information. Uh, now I do think uh, we should apply the same reasoning to our as to other similar problems. We should ask ourselves what's the underlying distribution of, for instance, uh, the density of uh, planetary systems in a galaxy of particular type uh, dependent on things like metallicity and dispersions of metallicity and star forming histories, etc., etc. So, actually, in order to uh, build a better theoretical framework, we need simply to uh, investigate with help of nowadays available massive parallel numerical simulations, investigate more and more of the overall parameter space. So, this is something which uh, should be obvious, but often is not, and especially often is not in, in popular uh, representations and in the media, uh, where people simply expect some kind of a binary zero or one answer, and we cannot really give such answers. We instead wish to give a kind of distribution over various uh, parameters. And this is uh, something which needs to be more and more emphasized because nowadays we are slowly but surely entering into the realm of uh, a very exact search for biosignatures and perhaps technosignatures as well. And we should be very much uh, worrying about the fact that uh, often recognition of such signatures uh, will depend on uh, hypotheses with many free parameters and uh, those free parameters should not be discarded lightly and should, we should really investigate how uh, variation in more than one parameter changes our outcome and this is exactly why Bayesian analysis again is the only way to go. Okay, hey, thanks. I don't see any other questions, so I would like to thank again to Milan and say, okay, goodbye. It was my pleasure. Okay, okay. thank you very much.